Aș vrea să-l prezint pe nimeni altul decât așa cum se numește Chairman and CEO of Profiles International USA. Aș putea spune șeful meu, dar mai am un alt șef, Derek McKenna, acolo, care spune că singurul meu șef este cățelul meu, Elsie, un Westy de 10 ani. Uh, Bud? Your microphone is okay? Yep. It's okay? Yep. It's, uh, it's good. Uh, I will change it. Can you hear? Okay. We're good. Okay, perfect. I will change the, the slides for you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me back in your beautiful country. Uh, I don't know if Doro would introduce me if he let you know that I have a little bit of uh, laryngitis. <coughs> so I'm going to go slow and fast. So we'll make sure that we get through this, <coughs> myself as well as yourself. You know, I was here two years ago, and it's great to be back <coughs> two years ago. We're up in uh, <coughs> Roshoff. If we'd been up there yesterday or today, we might not see you with the snow. So thanks for bringing the uh, beautiful weather to us today. You know, I feel humbled and I feel honored <coughs> to be part of this 10-year celebration of Profiles Romania. I'd like to congratulate and salute Dr. Dima and his staff, a very, very top professional people. Uh, for 10 years, they had tremendous success. <clears throat> In those 10 years, one year, Dr. Dima was Rookie of the Year in profiles. <clears throat> In the other nine years, he was in the top five every year. So let's congratulate Dr. Dima and his staff. Before I really start my uh, key points with you, I think it's important for you, and I would venture to say that in this room, we, we probably have 70% are HR professionals. And it could be a little higher. But I'd like to give you my point of view on the HR role <clears throat> and put it on the record. Because as I go through and share things with you, it's going to be important for you to know where my head is in relationship to your profession. And it's very, very important that <clears throat> I do this with you because I'm going to take a few moments and share with you what I do with my company, <clears throat> Profiles International. I believe that the HR department, the HR department head, the HR manager <clears throat> should be part of the strategic planning committee in companies. I also believe <clears throat> that the HR manager or department head should be in every monthly department head meeting at Profiles International, we have about 18 department head managers that manage about 170 people on two campuses back in Texas. We have, on Friday morning, a breakfast at 7.30, then we work from 8 to 10, and the very first person that I introduce is the HR manager. We have, at Profiles International, we have what we call a team player of the month. That's our top employee. And they receive $100. And then they have an opportunity to go to lunch with myself, with their department head manager, and then also with the HR manager. We take them out to the country club for a nice lunch. I think you'll probably get my feel in relationship to where I perceive HR blogs. We also have 
with HR. I believe HR should be in a meeting with the CEO and the, or the president of the company. The profiles we do. <clears throat> they either meet with myself or our Nolly, our president, every week. I think it's very, very important for HR to really synchronize <clears throat> and tie themselves together with the management people inside the company. <clears throat> I think it's important for HR managers to make sure that the strategic support that they provide to the organization is in line or is in alignment with you know, the strategic plans that we have for the company. So what I'm sharing with you this morning is, is that <clears throat> I really believe that the HR managers, the HR professionals, many of you in this room today <clears throat> should be very connected with <clears throat> upper management in the organization. So I'm going to share with you a pretty straightforward presentation today. You got my philosophy and relationship to you and where you fit in the organization. <clears throat> I really only have one message to give to you today. <clears throat> it's kind of a piece of guidance, advice. I promise if you listen to it, it will have a dramatic impact upon your careers, your success, a view of HR with, with inside the company you work for, and the productivity and profitability of the companies you all work for, <coughs> or possibly own. Let me see a show of hands. How many people in the room own the company, own your own company? Okay. Probably about a dozen. <clears throat> well, I'd like for you to listen to some advice that could change your life and change the direction of your company forever. And now as I look out and see your faces, you're sitting there saying, okay, where is he going from here? <clears throat> I told you it was simple. Here it is. You must become obsessed with return on investment, ROI. <clears throat> For me, return on investment is very, very simple. It means for the money I put into the company, what did I receive in return? You know, as long as you get more back than you put in, then it's a positive for you as the owner. Or let me put it in <clears throat> your terminology. How many of you uh, on like a pension fund for your retirement? Any of you? Uh, or how about just a savings account where you have money put away when you do retire? Okay, number of you. <clears throat> I, wanna make a, I wanna make a deal with you. Deals with money. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is this. I'd like to ask you to give me your money that you set aside for retirement. <clears throat> I'd like for you to give that to me and I'll guarantee you legally that I'll give it back to you the exact the same amount of money in three years. Is that a good deal? <laughs> Drop, dropped a few notes. So, so anyway, Oh, I wanted to figure out some kind of way to use Dor Doru to help me out here. <clears throat> okay, so none of you would want to do that deal with me. The reason being, you get no return on your investment. You get no money back. <clears throat> See, if you gave somebody the money, you'd probably want to get back a few percentage points, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. So you got a return on your investment. Well, welcome to the world of CEOs. That's where we are. We think in terms of money. We think in terms of numbers. So you have to in turn internalize this ROI concept. <clears throat> Here's what's gonna happen if you don't. 
you're going to become very vulnerable, very vulnerable in relationship to maybe your job, maybe your career, maybe your future. <clears throat> so what we're sharing with you today is how to deal, <clears throat> how to interact, and how to work with people like myself. CEOs, <clears throat> presidents, department heads, whatever the case may be. That being said, that's pretty good, thanks. Dr. Dima. Well, yeah, we'll, just, we'll just play around with it, but it's okay. <clears throat> what I want to do is, is that I think we need to have some discussion, and of course I want to discuss with you the old world HR, and I want to move you into the new world HR. <clears throat> As we look at the old world HR, you have to look at your profession as it's viewed by senior executives, by the people you answer to, the people you respond to. <clears throat> and I call this the, the, uh, the view from above. <clears throat> now, it's kind of hard for me to get into this with you because I believe so strongly in HR. I believe so much in the value of HR with inside our organization. <clears throat> but your profession, is traditionally looked down upon by senior level people in other departments, accounting department, marketing department, sales department, <coughs> IT department. Now, uh, there's a, a quote by a Professor Williams that really says a lot in relationship to the HR profession is how it's viewed. <clears throat> and this is pretty, pretty strong, but this is how many, many senior executives look at the HR profession. <clears throat> they really see it more as you shuffle paper, you handle paper, you're an administrative person, and you end up getting most of the, most of the jobs <clears throat> inside the HR that no one wants to do, deal with. So uh, what they do is they see you as not contributing to the company. They see you, thank you, thank you sir. <clears throat> they see you as actually taking money from the company but not putting anything back in, like say the sales department, for example. So when that happens, that makes you vulnerable. <clears throat> I'll give you a good example. In the UK, back in 2008, 2009, when the recession first hit, <clears throat> the UK Royal Mail Service had drastic cuts. And when you look at these numbers, pretty mind-boggling. And so as you, as you look at this, <clears throat> let's take it a step further and look at inside the organization, training and development. Training and development. <clears throat> and when we had the recession taking place around the world, everybody's budget got cut. And to me, that's the time you should be increasing a budget. <clears throat> many, many companies, many, many organizations cut their budget. And one area they cut very strongly in was in the <clears throat> sales department. Well, we did a Profiles International, we hired 25 more salespeople. Because things go up, things go down. That's how life works. That's how the business sector works. <clears throat> but look at the overhead. Look at the survey. It's kind of mind-boggling. Only 2%, only 2%. In the training and development, the HR arena actually saw a possibility of increase in their in their budget. I think one of the demoralizing aspects of life as an HR practitioner is that you work hard. You
What's your perception? <clears throat> so what happened was, <clears throat> with the CEOs in his survey, many, many CEOs, many, many company owners focus on numbers only. <clears throat> but it's changing. So it's changing years when you had another job. <clears throat> Did you leave that company because of the company or did you leave the company because of who you work for? Have any of you ever had a bad boss? You can't raise your hand because they might be in here, right? So, you know, just, uh, just uh, blink your eyes and I can see your eyes so at least we'll know that. <clears throat> Here's what senior level executives, CEOs around this world globally are thinking. <clears throat> When people leave the company, it's like a library of knowledge that walks out of the door. The employee's mind, the employee's head. <clears throat> so when you think about that, you gotta realize we're in a very, very strong talent war. Talent, looking for good people, looking for good managers, good look, look, looking for productive people. And so we as CEOs, we as managers, as owners of companies, we got to be concerned about the people that work for us. Or let me ask you another question. How many of, in, how many of you in here have had a person that works for you leave you and go to work for another company, a competitor? You see a show of hands, anybody have that happen? Okay, now here's the question. Did the competitor that hired your employee away from you, did that competitor send you a thank you note? No? They should have at least sent you a thank you note to say, thanks for spending the money, thanks for training them, thanks for giving them the benefits, thanks for getting them ready to come to work for me. And they didn't have the courtesy of sending you a thank you note. See, you got to start all over again doing it again, right? You got to interview, you got to find the person that's going to go to work for you. And that costs time and money. They say that the, the rule of thumb, statistically and financially, for when you lose an employee, takes their annual salary, you, that annual salary goes out the window and you start over. That's what it costs you to replace a lost employee. So CEOs, company owners, senior level executives are very, very conscious now of people that work for them to make sure they show up the next day because People are the greatest assets inside a company. <clears throat> Here's another, another uh, survey <clears throat> in relationship to talent. Number one, you might not be able to see that, but number one, strategies for managing talent. Number one thing for CEOs, senior executives. Number one. <clears throat> so as you look at this, as we go through and talk about old HR, new HR, you gotta keep in mind that you have a tremendous opportunity in front of you. People are the number one business driver in the whole world. But the people that run and own a company, they, they are still numbers people. Now you probably heard that 80% of the people, that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It could be sales, it could be IT, it can be customer service, but that's kind of the rule of thumb, and it's a global statistic. Also, low employees' performance costs run between 10 to 50% of the annual payroll. CEOs look at that. They look at productivity of the people to measure against the dollars they're paying them. 
See, any company, all they want to do is get back <coughs> for a dollar's pay to get back a dollar's worth of work. Pretty, pretty easy path. <coughs> You've probably seen this overhead at one of Dr. Dima's previous workshops. Non-producers, <coughs> bottom performers run about 16%. And superior run about the same number. <clears throat> put you put some whiskey in there. Uh, yeah, and some honey. Just a, just a little bit. I wasn't ready for it for breakfast, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the average performers, sixty-eight percent. Now think as if you are a business owner, or think as the department head or think just directly from an HR standpoint, what would it mean to the company if you could move the bottom performers into the middle area? Or what if you could move the largest percentage at 68%, move them into the top area? What would that mean to the company? What would that mean to the organization? What would that mean to you? Remember, it's all about numbers. Let's look at it another way. Let's look at unskilled or semi-skilled versus skilled. <clears throat> the average producers, 19% more than the bottom producers. The superior or top producers, 19% more than the average. That's a 38% gap between the two. And they're doing the same job. And many times you're paying comparable money to them. Let's look at the skill. It's even, it even goes stronger. <clears throat> Average producers, 30% more than the 32% more than the bottom producers. <clears throat> Superior, 30%, 32% more than the average. That's a 64% gap between the two people, two people doing the same job. See, I'm a numbers guy, so I'm going to give you lots of numbers. <clears throat> you have to keep in mind with your position, you've got to be able to determine the difference between average and bottom performance. Enormous opportunity. Unbelievable opportunity. I call it your keys to the kingdom. Your keys to the kingdom. See, here's the challenge for you. Which of the 20% are the top producers? Do you have a profile on them? Do you know why they excel and others fail? Do you know how to hire more? <clears throat> Let me ask you another question in relationship to hiring. <clears throat> how many of you in here actually Part of your responsibilities are to hire people. Okay, good portion. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Have you ever made a bad hire? Yeah, yeah. See, we wouldn't be human if we didn't do that, right? And now here's, here's how I've gotten around this to make myself feel good. Because here's a process. You have an individual that you interview, and they walk the walk, they talk the talk, they know a lot about your company, they probably are better prepared for the interview than we might be. And then you hire them. And then less than two weeks go by, and you're sitting in your office and you're saying, I don't think Bud's going to make this. I don't think he's going to be able to get this job done. And then, here's my cop-out. Cop-out's a Romanian terminology, but that's where you make yourself feel good. A <clears throat> cop-out. Here's how I get around this. I say, you know what, I think I hired this twin, brother or sister. Because the person I hired is not the same person that showed up for the job. So, let me ask it another way. Have any of you ever hired a twin brother or sister that showed up to do the job instead of the one you interviewed? Yeah. 
So if in the event you get a bad hire and we're all susceptible to do that, <clears throat> then what you want to do is, is be able to deal with a cop-out. <clears throat> now, Dr. Dima and his staff did a number of your already clients of Profiles Romania. We have, in our portfolio, we have an assessment called a Profile XT. One called a Profile Sales Assessment. And what this does is, it helps you make good hires, good promotions. What it really does is, it tells you the answer to three questions, gives you the answer to three questions. The first question that answers for you is this. Can the person get the job done intellectually, mentally? The second thing it answers is, does the person have the interest, motivation, and drive to do the job? And the third question it answers is this. <clears throat> Will the person be able to perform the job from a behavioral, from a personality stand standpoint? See, those three questions help you in the interview process. Those three questions help you if you're gonna be promoting someone. Because when you look at it, that's really what you wanna know. Can they do the job? Will they do the job? And will they stay on the job? Do they fit the corporate culture? Do they fit into the culture within your company, your organization? Now you have to ask yourself, do you have a plan for developing more like the ones you already have. You know, I call that cloning people. You know, it's probably a universal word, cloning people. That means getting more like the good ones you already have. <clears throat> well, here's another question for you. When you interview people, you try and make everything stay kind of even. What I mean by that is you say, Okay, I want to have 20% top performers and 20% bottom performers. The other ones can fall in there, that's 60%. Is that your mindset when you're interviewing, when you're hiring? You don't really make your mind up to make a bad hire, do you? You want to try and hire the best all the time. Well, the only thing is, is that you're only seeing what we call the tip of the iceberg. You're not really seeing inside the person. <clears throat> and that's the tools that uh, Dora and his team have that can help you be more proficient at what you do. <clears throat> do you have a methodology to help raise the bottom performers to the mid-range? Do you have, have a plan to move the people from the mid-range to the top? I want you to know if you do, you actually have the keys to the kingdom. And you're on your way to a tremendous career. Uh, Jack Welch uh, used to run GE. He had some unusual management theories. A lot of them good. Some of them I had a little disagreement with. <clears throat> One that he had that worked at GE for him. He would every year take the, bo the bottom 10% and terminate them. Now, I, don't, I don't believe in that philosophy. That's what he did. It was successful for him. <clears throat> but see, you have to really know your people inside and out to be able to pull that one off. He just figured that GE had a lot of money and they could get by. So this new world, H HR, we're moving out of the old world. We're getting into the new world now. <clears throat> this emerging role, return on investment, and then the human capital to minimize your financial risk. <clears throat> now, we still have some CEOs that have not made the trip in relationship to their respect and belief in the HR professionals. <clears throat> As we look at the the chart, 56% are neutral. 33% say HR is effective. 11% say they're ineffective. 
So you've got 67% that are on the other side of the fence that you've got to win over. So let me share something very, very important here for you. To be credible, you must demonstrate, you must demonstrate that you can deliver tangible, measurable value. Now your question is, how do you do it? <clears throat> the only way to do this is you do it by proven ROI, return on investment. <clears throat> it's crucial for you, <clears throat> you have to demonstrate this in order for you to be able to promote yourself with inside the organization. You've got to demonstrate the value that you deliver. <clears throat> that being said, you have to develop what we call a value proposition. You've got to identify the people that really impact the strategic corporate objectives. And you've got to make sure you have the initiatives for the program addressed. You gotta find out the issues in relationship to the cost of the organization. You have to quantify the total cost of your proposed program. <clears throat> you gotta quantify the total benefits to the organization. ROI, and you, got the, you got the formula, total benefits and its cost divided by cost. Now, several of you are taking pictures of this slide. <clears throat> If you'd make a note, Dr. Deem and his staff have all the tools for you. And they can make things available for you. <clears throat> so one of the takeaways for you is, is that talk to Dr. Deem and some of his staff in relationship to some of the things I'm sharing with you this morning. <clears throat> and I guarantee it's gonna change your, your life drastically. You might have, if you've been to several of Dr. Dr. Deem's workshops, you might have seen this letter. This is a letter from one of the clients, <coughs> Profiles International. It's with a very, very large uh, pharmaceutical company. This is one of the divisions called CyberVision. <coughs> but they were doing 80,000 a month, or about a million a year, after we had them and used some of our tools with some of the things on RI we talked with them about, they went to a million dollars a month in six months. <clears throat> they went from seven million to ten and a half million in their projections the next year. <clears throat> they went from seventeen million to twenty one and a half million. <clears throat> they doubled the sales in the second year. Now, how many sales managers would not like to have that kind of results? How many HR people would be opposed to that? So there are two areas that you have to validate ROI. <clears throat> two areas, people and money. People and money. <clears throat> the people side, we have tools we can help you through this. <clears throat> Dr. Dima, as I mentioned, <clears throat> has everything available for you. You can get in and answer some of the questions that you saw up on a slide earlier. The money side is where I live. What value are they delivering? <clears throat> and if you make another note for Dr. Dima, he's got some calculators that will help you deal with sales productivity, employee turnover, and superior performance. So just by be, you being here this morning, and tolerating a voice in what I'm attempting to share with you, <clears throat> Dr. Dima can make sure that you internalize that and have that at your fingertips. <clears throat> so let me, as I get towards the end of our, my presentation, <clears throat> some key learning points, some key takeaways I'd like for you to take with you as we pull this to a close. Every business has a financial impact. You have to use it to determine where to spend time and budgets. <clears throat> Another very important thing is successful solutions are linked to important strategic objectives. See, that's where HR comes in. That's where you really come in. <clears throat> successful solutions are ones that target ROI, return on investment. <clears throat> See,
See, a company can't stay in business unless they get the ROI. They got to bring in more than what they spend. So as I began, I said I had one message that every one of you in here need to internalize in this room. <clears throat> you must be obsessed with ROI. Or you can be vulnerable to change and to the change in times. <clears throat> in, in closing, I'd like to leave you one, one thought that is very, very important to me from a personal standpoint. It goes like this. When you take in a person's money, when it's all overdone and said with, all you have to show for it is the money you take in from the person. And when you take in a person's time, you've actually recent out that person's life. You extracted from that person a part of their life you will never, ever give back to them. May I thank all of you in this room for sharing part of your life with me today been a very, very positive group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.